Hello, welcome to Lazada Insider, featuring knowledge that makes a difference. We share trusted insights, forward-looking perspectives, and exclusive expert interviews to keep you ahead of the curve. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Lazada Insider Consumer Insights Series. And I'm your host, Katrina, Senior Manager from Lazada Group Strategy. Today, we're going to talk about omnichannel. I mean, if years ago you thought it was still a buzzword in retail, today it's already become the reality and the key for success in the future. And we're going to discuss this topic in detail with our expert guest, Neil from Kantar. Well, this pandemic, the prevalence of technology and the changes of consumer behavior have almost redefined the word shopping. And Neil is here today to help us decode what business need to know and need to do to win in the omnichannel world. Neil is currently the Strategic Insight Director from Kantar World Panel, and he comes with more than 20 years of experience in market research and shopper and customer analytics. He's passionate about delivering actionable shopper insights and recommendations to his broad range of local and multinational clients. Hi, Neil. It's great to have you on Lazada Insider. Thank you, Katrina. And it's a pleasure to be here. Very exciting to um, you know, share some ideas and insights with you today. Um, my name, is, as you've said, is Neil. I'm an insight director at the World Panel. Um, I'm actually based in Singapore. Um, I've been here for the last five years, but as you mentioned, um, I've been in the region quite some time going back to the early 2000s. So I've got quite a lot of experience traveling to you know, most of the countries in the region. Um, I'm an avid shopper. I do a lot of online shopping, but I also love um, you know, to get out into the offline world as well. So hoping today to, to really have an interesting conversation with you. That's great. That's great. You've certainly spent most of your career in Asia, I guess, you know, since 2000. I mean, no wonder you really know our consumers in this region like the back of your hand. So let's talk about your latest observations then. Uh, well, we know that, you know, the pandemic has really appended what and how consumers shop in FMCG setting. So if you look at consumers shopping behavior this year versus 2020 and uh, pre-COVID-19, what are your major observations on the shift? And how has this change actually impacted the overall FMCG landscape? Mm. So I think um, whilst there are obviously lots of um, changes still happening in consumers' lifestyles, um, many of the changes are, are not actually new. They're either things that were perhaps already underway in the pre-COVID world um, or have been accelerated um, you know, since the, the pandemic started. And we're sort of seeing a continuation of that. So as people get used to living now um, you know, with the restrictions and with this new way of life, um, you know, sh their shopping behaviors and, and retailers are adjusting to that one. Um, so for example, um, you know, in home, it's, it's such a massive shift you know, when the pandemic first hit, we were suddenly, you know, all locked up at home. Uh, we couldn't go out to restaurants. We potentially couldn't access certain retailers if they were in malls that were, were locked down or, or were too far away or outside of our even outside of a zone where we were allowed to travel. Um, so certainly mobility um, continues to weigh heavily on, on shoppers. Um, and we continue to see waves and waves of, of new breakouts and new government responses to that one. Um, so I think, you know, the, the whole in-home space has, has continued to play out with things like cooking, uh, more at home, doing things more with your family, coming up with new ways of, of sort of entertainment at home. And, and, um, you know, as I say, um, making up for for not being able to go out and enjoy it or uh, meet friends outside of the home as well. So I think that um, in-home element, food and beverages has been incredibly important for, you know, for continuing to drive the growth of, of FMCG. I mean, the growth rates have slowed down. Um, you know, we saw a lot of immediate panic buying from some of the populations, you know, through the middle of, uh, you know, 2020. Um, Clearly, that has gradually, again, disappeared as people have got used to new lockdowns coming into effect. So the growth rates are still there, but at a slightly slower pace. Um, what else has happened is, again, because of mobility, um, because of 
the you know the need to perhaps avoid going into busy stores and and, and wanting to avoid being in crowds um, basket sizes have also you know continued to go up but again this is actually something we were seeing in 2019 and, and actually for many many years before that one the average basket size has been going up frequency of shopping has been coming down um, but as i say that has been accelerated by covid and and certainly will continue um, into the future probably as well um, i think from a you know from a channel point of view again linked to mobility and the pandemic the big box retailers really have have, have struggled um, proximity has has been a, a resounding success okay i think e-commerce again and we'll probably talk more about this of course you know everyone knew that e-commerce is is rapidly growing and would do very well but i think the surprising thing has perhaps been the resilience of traditional trade um people have sort of flooded out and going back to their mom and pop retailer that they probably haven't been shopping in for you know for for a long time simply because they need to get something quick get in and get out and get home again um so i think you know it, it, this is all playing together and really changing I guess the the missions that shoppers go to different channels for. So, you know, those traditional big routine um, and stock up occasions are more and more now being done in smaller and smaller retailers. Um, so that's quite surprising, and and seeing how you know categories are, are having to adapt to that and, and retailers. So I think yeah, those are sort of some of the the changes that we're seeing that are a continuation and an acceleration, I think, of, of what we've seen previously. So if you break down the observation a little bit, um, have you observed any interesting dynamics by country? Uh, and if you can talk a bit more about category and channel, that would be really interesting for us to know. Sure. So I, th I think one of the key things that we always talk about at, at Kantar when we look at the data is there's not really an average Southeast Asia. So although we see all these trends at a macro level, um, you know, when you start to drill down into the individual markets and categories and retailers, of course, you start to see interesting nuances. So, you know, I think the Philippines, I think most people would know, you know, they've, they've probably had the, one of the longest lockdowns in the world. Um, and whereas other countries, sort of benefited from lockdowns and had that initial stocking up, um, the Philippines was sort of sent into a shock recession and, and FMCG has really sort of suffered since then. So, you know, that country stands out versus, um, you know, elsewhere like in Thailand and Vietnam, where we actually saw some quite high growth rates um, around the initial outbreak. Um, and now, as I say, through into now into 2021, we continue to see differences in the individual markets. Um, some of it, is you know influenced by governments so for example in thailand we see um, handouts uh, either to the general population or to specific parts of the population like lower income households given um, you know additional income to spend through the blue flag scheme so again depending on how governments are reacting to the different situations um, as well and then of course as i mentioned previously we we are still having small waves of um you know the, the 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 virus breaking out so looking at vietnam it was a country that had very very low um uh, you know numbers of, of infections and deaths through 2020 and was praised globally of, of how they shut down very early and managed the situation but has now had some very severe um outbreak you know to the point where people in Ho Chi Minh were locked at home and, and the army had to come in and deliver their groceries. So, you know, that's obviously having a clear impact on the sort of categories and, and how you shop. Um, you know, if you're having to put your order in and, and have a soldier deliver it in a couple of days time. So, you know, really, really interesting. I think from a category perspective, as I say, food and beverages are having a great time with you know, everyone being locked up and unable to go to restaurants. Um, I think home care, of course, as, as again, as um, some of the categories have done well, particularly around home hygiene. Um, laundry has, has struggled a bit more because, you know, people are going out less. They don't have perhaps uniforms or, or work clothes. They just have one set of clothes to wear. So, you know, some of the um, specific categories may have struggled. Um, and then in personal care, again, some big differences between the basic staples, you know, your shampoos and your soaps, um, which have, you know, have just continued. Everyone needs to use them. And we do see some, um, you know, more people obviously looking for anti-back and, and hygiene particular products um, 
versus some of the more uh, individual or, or higher end products such as moisturizers and cosmetics, which you know have taken a massive hit. Um, so I think again, there's some some very interesting dynamics at, at, at category level. People have had to make some very hard decisions to drop some things from their baskets uh, in order to better manage their household incomes as well. Interesting. I mean, these are very good um, observations and uh, changes that you have uh, have seen right in the countries. Um, so as you mentioned, there are still waves of uh, COVID nineteen virus, and we know that probably much of the next one to two years remain a little bit uncertain, right? But uh, based on, on your understanding on the data, on the trends that you see right now, how do yeah. you really foresee these behaviors that you mentioned uh, progress in the next one to two years? Yeah, so I think obviously we're all waiting for the, you know, for the moment we can all you know, go back out into the world. Um, you know, I think perhaps most of us thought that this would be over and, and 2021 would kind of at some point get back to normal. But as you rightly said, it it seems to almost feel never ending. And, you know, I watched the news about the UK and, you know, they're having their highest cases for, for uh, you know, for six months. So it does seem that the new normal or whatever is, is a long way off. Um, so, you know, for the, I, I would imagine through 2022, a lot of the, you know, in-home behaviors, working from home still, even if offices do slowly start to reopen, I think a lot of people will want to um, still work at home, maybe two, three days a week. Um, but of course, as things do open up, I think food and beverage will probably be um, the category that sees perhaps the biggest shifts, because there will be you know, a lot of that out of home consumption starting up again. Um, you know, people real, really want to go out and have a meal with their friends and their families, etc. Um, so I think the food and beverage categories, uh, as I say, in particular, um, I think also as people are allowed to go back and mobility, um, you know, eases up, some of the categories of which were initially cut out because they're not essential anymore, again, will also start to come back. So as people need to start wearing two sets of clothes and have uniforms, you know, laundry categories might start to do better again. People want to start looking better. So again, all the sort of the, the, the beauty element of personal care, the deodorants, the moisturizers, the makeup, uh, et cetera, will also um, rebound quite healthily as well. Um, and I think as people start to um, you know, see that recovery and, and hopefully people that have, um, you know, lost their job and suffered can start to get back to work again and economies get going um, and they've got more disposable income. You know, I think people will start to look to treat themselves as well. We've we've been under pressure and, 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 and quite depressing times now for coming up for two years. So I think the potential for um, people to want to treat themselves to perhaps something a bit more premium than they would have bought before um, is also potentially a very interesting angle as well. You share quite a lot about the dynamics when it comes to categories uh, and when it comes to different segments of uh, products like premium products. How about from a channel perspective? How do you foresee, you know, currently, obviously, consumers are mostly staying at home, right? Um, and they, they do a lot of shopping online. Where do you see this play in the near future? Yeah, so I think... Uh, to me, I think the proximity element and the convenience element is is something that people are going to get used to, um, and are going to adapt and adopt uh, as as habits. So again, sort of convenience and on online shopping were things that were growing prior to the pandemic, but have really been accelerated. And I think now that people have got used to, um, you know, having things delivered or you know just popping out and buying close to home. I think that will continue, um, you know, for, for some time. And I think the big box retailers, again, were struggling pre-COVID, you know, through 2017, 18, 19, the hypermarket channel has, has not been doing well. And I think it's going to be really tough for that channel to, to really recover. Um, so I think it's a, a, a great space, as I say, for, for um, online shopping and convenience. Um, the the ability to get things now um you know is uh is, is going to become more important you know we're all living on our smartphones um you know real time is 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 where it's at and you know we do see that um in models all over the world with you know delivery times coming down and down people just 
want to be able to shop and get it and, and have it sort of delivered or it's close to home. So definitely, I think from a channel perspective, the growth channels at the moment around e-commerce and proximity, um, I think will do well. Where I'm sort of undecided is is traditional trade. You know, as I said, it's it's had a bit of a renaissance um, because it benefits from the proximity angle. You know, there, there's hundreds of thousands of them across you know across countries in Southeast Asia. Um, however, a lot of it, as I said, is as a result of um, government stimulus. You can only spend it in certain channels and certain retailers. So I think potentially the traditional trade may slow down and eventually stagnate again. Um, but yeah, I think, as I say, the, the growth will certainly be uh, e-commerce and proximity uh, into the future. Um, just one more thing. I think basket sizes, as I mentioned, they've been going up and up and up and that has been accelerated. I, I, I do see that that trend will also continue. I think people, again, are consolidating trips um, they've got used to, as I say, um, shopping and trying to get more things in, in, in one go in order to bring that convenience into their life. So, you know, I, again, I do see that basket sizes will continue to rise and, and shopping frequency, um, you know, will continue to gradually uh, decline. I see. So if we zoom into e-commerce a little bit more, as consumers actually becoming more savvier in this space, and uh, there must be some interesting trends emerged uh, in that area. So maybe you can tell us your observation. Uh, what are some of the interesting dynamics that you have seen in e-commerce that business need to know? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's it's a bit like the the classic, you can't average uh, you can't average Asia, you can't average Southeast Asia, you can't really average um, how e-commerce is developing as well. And I think that's really fascinating, um, you know, when you start to look into the data um, at the different stages that, the, again, that the countries are in. Um, so, you know, I was just looking at, at some of the data earlier. So in Ho Chi Minh, again, the recent lockdowns there have actually pushed the penetration of, of online uh, shopping above 50%. Um, so that's the first time I've ever seen more than half of a particular um, part of a population, you know, as I say, more than half are now buying their groceries through, through online retail. So that's a big milestone. Um, but you also see, you know, much lower levels in, in certain other demographics in rural areas, etc. So there are these, you know, different stages that all the countries are at. Um, but what is interesting is that despite all the different development levels, the countries are actually all following a very similar journey. So it starts off um, predominantly with, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the city dwelling, higher income, younger, uh, you know, early adopters of e-commerce. And then it gradually ripples out to more sort of um, secondary towns and cities and then slightly older consumers. And then eventually now, as I say, it, it is now making it out into rural areas and older and um, less affluent consumers. So, the, it, it, you know, the, the differences and the similarities are, um, you know, are very important to, um, to look at. Um, from a, you know, from a category point of, of view as well, again, there's, there are big differences between different countries. But it seems that they all start at the same place, which is the first people to go online are those people in the cities and the more affluent and younger. And therefore, it tends to be things like cosmetics, moisturizers um, and the more, as I say, uh, individualized beauty products. Um, and then gradually, as uh, you know, shopping online becomes a bit more uh, frequent and a bit more mainstream, that's when we start to see other personal care categories creeping in so your your uh, you know your soaps your shampoos your body lotions and then you know a couple of years after that further developments happen and now you start to see um, home care products and even you know food and, and, and beverage products creeping into those baskets as well so again it's it's really interesting the similarities and also um, you know the differences as well um, and then from a from an actual uh, online perspective if we if we break it down you've also got the different plays between um, you know the the um, 
the platforms like the Lazadas of the world versus how, you know, social commerce plays a role in, in certain people's lives. And then some of these other models coming now down from China, such as, um, you know, O2O and group buying and, and uh, you know, all those other um, fragmentation, if you like, of, of online as well. So it is an incredibly interesting um, channel. Um, it's it's evolving incredibly rapidly, so it's really interesting to see all these differences and, as I say, those those similarities. Yeah, it's very interesting, I, and I completely echo with you when you talk about, you know, actually these changes of um, demographic, right, of uh, online shoppers actually correlate very well with the category dynamics and the category uptake uh, in the online space. And uh, you are absolutely right when it comes to. The, the different new models of uh, commerce. So I guess in the near future, it won't be like um, specific isolated models, but really all these different kind of um, channels and touch points working together eventually to serve the, the customer better. And that's essentially the essence of um, omni-channel. Um, so like what you said, Actually, in Southeast Asia, the penetration of e-commerce still on the lower side, especially when we compare with other more e-commerce matured countries in Asia. Um, so what I think this means is that this region still has quite a huge potential to grow. So where do you think the top three untapped opportunities lies in for, for further growth? And uh, what does it mean for brands in this region? Yeah, I mean the the opportunity size for you know for e-commerce is is absolutely enormous. Um, I mean, trying to think of top three is is actually quite difficult. Um, if I think from just purely the penetration point of view, so you know, getting more shoppers adding online to their channel repertoire, as you've said, we're already at fifty percent in Ho Chi Minh, but elsewhere there's there's massive headroom. So I mentioned in rural, we are starting to see um, an acceleration of, of rural households starting to engage with online. Um, but I think the highest penetration level is, is uh, either in Vietnam or in Thailand. It's around about 20 percent. So not only is it, you know, 25 to 30 percent behind what we see in, you know, in, in urban and those bigger cities, it then has a, a 50 percent gap to the rest of the population. So, you know, there's there's huge opportunities just from the point of view of the shoppers and rural is one i mentioned that obviously the older um generations the less affluent um are also you know not the early adopters of e-commerce e e um but as systems and platforms become easier to use um as payment systems evolve as trust in the in the ecosystem develops um as delivery systems emerge to you know to fulfill orders um we are seeing these you know penetration black holes if you like um suddenly there is a spark of light and, and people are actually breaking through and, and beginning to use e-commerce more so i mean I, I think i've mentioned like three or four you know opportunities just if we just look at you know getting more shoppers into e-commerce there's a couple of other angles we can think about as well there's the more basket angle so it's not just about someone shopping online. I can do that once and then disappear. And I would count towards the, you know, to the, towards the penetration of Lazada, for example. But if I come back and repeat, I'm still in that, you know, I'm still in that penetration. But now my frequency has gone up from one to two. And what we're actually seeing on average across Southeast Asia is now people are using online about six times each, okay? So that means there's probably some that use it once or twice. There's some that are already maybe using it 12 times a year, like once a month, but the average is around about six, okay? Now compare that to China or the UK where the average online shopper actually buys groceries around about 20 times a year. Again, that's an average. So there's gonna be people only buying once or twice, but there's probably people buying all, you know, close to once a week, if not bi-weekly. So there's huge you know, opportunities as well to, to continue to engage those online shoppers, to make them come back and, and repeat 
and make another online purchase in a couple of weeks or a month's time. And I think the, you know, the, the, the beauty of online is because you get all their details, you know, you get their email address, you've got their order, you know what they bought before, you have that opportunity to then re-engage, uh, you know, with those shoppers and, and send them something to, you know, to, to spark their interest. So there's, again, there's, there's massive headroom there, you know, the, the sky is not quite the limit on it, but, you know, you can consider people buy their groceries, um, you know, a few hundred times a year, there's a lot of baskets to tap into. Okay. So we've got loads of shoppers that we can reach out to. We've got loads of more baskets amongst those shoppers. And then I think the third level, so once people are buying online, you know, every week or every, uh, every other week, whatever we can get it to, you've then got the option and the ability to then drive more spending in each of those baskets. So as I mentioned early in the e-com journey, it's all about cosmetics and moisturizers, etc. And now it's gradually evolving. So more and more categories are being considered, uh, you know, when shoppers are, are doing their online grocery. Okay, so there's potentially more categories we can put in. And then the other thing as well is not just more categories, but the category themselves. How do we get them to spend more on that category? You know, either through um, upsizing or um, you know offering more premium items, unique items for online, so that each basket then becomes more valuable as well. Okay, so there's essentially three main areas around shoppers, baskets, and 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 more spend per basket, and then under each of those, there's sort of further opportunities. So, as I say, very difficult to to pick three. There's there's probably hundreds of, of opportunities out there. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and, you know, I know that Kantar recently published uh, a report on Omni Channel. And there you also have a lot of interesting advices to businesses who have both online and offline presence. I mean, a lot of our audience here also operate both in the digital world and also in the physical world. So what would be your advice to businesses uh, in terms of the best strategies to get the best return from both channels? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a big question. Um, as you say, these days, you know, brands, manufacturers, shoppers, you know, offline to online, it is one big ecosystem. But I think, you know, the, the crucial thing we need to keep in mind is that shopper is the same person. So, you know, what they're doing online and offline is is just part of their daily routine. They will have certain needs for certain products. If they've run out of something for dinner, they will need to go to a local shop to, to buy something. If they've got a bit more time to plan and, and notice what's running out around the household, they've got time to build, um, you know, an online basket before they hit, uh, you know, before they hit order. Um, so, you know, along the way, you know, this is also a, a sort of a two way journey as well. So in the past, um, you know, people would would just go very linear from a need to a decision and then to a purchase in an offline uh, store. Um, you know, what we can now do is is basically go backwards and forwards. So we can see things online, we can do our research, we can talk to friends, um, we can watch influencers, we can follow, um, you know, particular uh, sellers, etc. and watch videos. Um, we can then go offline and have a look at it in store, maybe see if there's any uh, trial sizes available or talk to, um, you know, an in-store advisor, maybe try a free sample and then potentially come back and, and again and buy it offline. Um, so the, the interplay between offline um, and, and online retail with that kind of social uh, media overlay to it has, has completely changed um, the rules, if you like. Um, so it's, it's critical for anyone that operates offline and online to, to really maintain their presence consistently you know, across the journey so that you know, I am available for that same shopper, whether they you know, have that immediate need and they go offline, whether they um, are, are planning an online purchase, I'm, I'm also present and I'm consistent in my messaging. Um, and then I'm also, you know, obviously very present through those social media channels so that I'm generating uh, chat, I'm generating um, interest, I'm getting followed, I'm getting recommendations through the community. Um, and then that's facilitating those instant sort of purchases as well. Okay, so 
as I say, it's it's critical for brands to be um, you know omnipresent across omnichannel. Um, and then I think the other thing to keep in mind as well is, although you know it's it's very fluid and, and shoppers now have so many choices to you know to to uh, to buy their grocery. We have to keep in mind that you know that online purchase shouldn't just be about moving an offline purchase online. Okay, if we do that, um, I think we've really missed you know an opportunity there. So um, again, when someone makes a decision to buy online, whether they've, uh, as I say, been building a basket, whether they've engaged with social media and they've come across something and they've been redirected, whatever it might be at that point where they go online, let's not just get them to buy what they would have bought offline, okay? And again, there's many, many ways um, that we can do that. Um, there's very exciting things, you know, around gamification. Um, there are, uh, you know, obviously intercepts, there are unique things that we can offer online, import products or, um, you know, things that won't be available offline. So you get a premium if you purchase this and it's only available for the next, you know, three or four days. Some of those examples have, have instantly sold out, you know, and, and um, have done very, very well for certain brands in certain categories. So there's things that you can do that are very exciting. Um, but there's even things that you can do at, at a much more basic level, just playing around with pack and price okay um, and I'll give you an example that's that's close to my heart which would be soft drinks um, so for example I um, I like to drink soft drinks I have a you know I have a glass every day and if I were to buy this category offline I would be limited by how much I can you know carry back from the store or carry to the taxi or, or what have you okay and as a result if I've got or a 1.5 liter, that's all I can carry. Um, I would be pouring into a glass with some ice, maybe 200, 250 ml a day. But by going online, I search for my soft drinks. What comes up at the top of the search, because we can you know, manipulate it and play around, is, is actually an offer on a 24 pack of my favorite soft drink. Now, suddenly, this looks attractive because I know I'm going to drink a lot of it. I drink it every day. It's bulky. I wouldn't buy this in the supermarket because I wouldn't be able to carry it home. Um, but I'm going to have this delivered to my door. So this is, you know, this is fantastic. And it's at an attractive price per serving. So I, I you know, I have it delivered and now I've got these cans of soft drink in the fridge. And what that effectively has done has moved my daily consumption from 200 to 250 immediately to 325 okay because i don't think anyone is going to open a can of soft drink and put it back in the fridge for tomorrow because it's going to be very flat and and um you know <laughs> not very tasty so immediately you've got a 30 percent boost on on uh, on my daily consumption rate so the category has been expanded so there are many, many examples of how incrementality can be done through online, through premiumization, through, um, you know, squeezing extra volume out of uh, out of shoppers, about getting them to add an extra category that they weren't originally planning for, as well as all those other exciting things with limited offers and exclusive um, deals, etc. So, yeah, loads of, of things that brands and businesses should be looking at when considering this sort of omni-channel play. That's very exciting. I mean, I really look forward to how the next one to two years will unfold, given this dynamics that's happening already in the retail space. Thank you so much, Neil. You know, um, as actually e-commerce is growing and the business are actually racing to, to, to explore the opportunity in the digital space, we actually got asked a lot, you know, is e-commerce actually the future? And I think our conversation today really sparked me to reflect on this question. Um, and I think number one, um, be where your consumers are. Number two, also think about, you know, what are the incremental value that uh, you can add? when you move consumer from one channel to the other, actually probably working both way. So I think what you share today, uh, Neil, is really something that's critical for businesses to understand and to rethink about their channel play uh, to prepare for the future of FMCG. Um, thanks a lot, Neil, for joining us and the great sharing. Thanks, Katrina, for having me. It was a great session. Thank you.
This is the Zana Insider. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you click follow and subscribe so you don't miss our latest insights and expert interviews. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, take care. La